I'm hopeful that more people will, will come for this important talk. Um, this is a part of our Visiting Faculty Scholars of Color series. Um, as some of you know, we bring four really amazing scholars um, here to be with us, three to four, um, every year. And um, we reach out to faculty and students and invite them to nominate uh, very interesting people who are doing interesting work. And Laura Perman, my dear friend and colleague, nominated our speaker for this morning. So I will turn it over to Laura, who will introduce Cecilia. Thanks, Sean, and thanks for your efforts to organize this series. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Cecilia Bruce Aguilar. I've been a big fan of and admirer of hers for a long time, and I'm thrilled that you're able to arrange your family and your personal situation <laughs> to come out here. So Cecilia is the Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. She was formerly an Associate Professor at Claremont Graduate University and also an Assistant Professor at the Center for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona. She has her PhD and MS from the University of Rochester and she has a BA in Economics from the Institute of Technological de Mexico. Yes, it's Spanish accent. <laughs> it's perfect. So this is the title of her talk today, Using Big and Critical Data to Unmask Inequities in Community College. One of the things that I admire about you is the nature of your research interests. So Cecilia's research interests focus on understanding educational and occupational trajectories of underrepresented students. She focuses on Latino students, English language learners, low-income students, first-generation students, and immigration students. She uses multidisciplinary perspectives and conceptual frameworks. Particularly important, I think, are the contributions that she's made to understanding the role of funds of knowledge and sources of capital in the process. As you might infer from her talk title, she uses quantitative methods, <laughs> um, regression analysis, multi-level models, DIS, social network analysis. And she also focuses on helping us understand the effectiveness of different types of policies and programs. So especially those that are targeted to to uh, particular groups like English language learners. She's focused on the transition to higher education. She's looked at financial aid policies. She's looked at school supports for academic achievement. And she's focused quite a bit on community colleges. And I think the space that you're in right now, focusing on the role of social media, big data, and community colleges, there's just so much to learn from the work that you're doing. So thank, thank you. you for being here today to share these insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, first I really want to thank Sean uh, for the invitation. I've, if if uh, Laura says that she admires my work, it's really a compliment because I've been a fan of their work for many long time. Uh, so uh, I really, really appreciate being here. It's just nice to to have time to share with you guys some of my work, my thoughts, uh, get your feedback, start some conversation, and always uh, start new relationships. I see also all faces, Charles. Charles used to work for us in this project that I'm going to talk about, uh, so he may have uh, better insights than me or different ones. So I invite Charles to share if he wants to do so. Uh, and it's now Dr. Charles. I have to remind <laughs> myself that, you know, that he's now uh, on this side of the world, which I'm. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much. I chose this topic or this title uh, for the uh, presentation because I'm really immersed in this world right now. And what I'm about to present is, is a collaborative uh, collaboration work between me and my colleague, Regina de la Men, in particular at the University of Arizona, but also many, many grad students who have helped us, just like, like Charles was at some point. Um, a lot of them just really help us challenge our thinking, push our ideas and the methods and what we were doing and trying to accomplish with this. And Laura is right, my complete focus right now is on community colleges. I profoundly believe that's where we need to focus our efforts on. If we really want to target, uh, if we really want to serve underrepresented students, marginalized students, and focus on issues of equity, I think we need to look at community colleges. So that's really a very conscious effort on our part. Now, currently, I think we, all of us have heard these terms, big data, um, businesses, the government, everybody's using this term. Not only big data, but I would even add a new component, data scientists, because I think they go hand in hand. 
Um, and people think of it as the new holy grail. It's going to help us better serve products, deliver services more efficiently and effectively, solve social problems. So it, it comes with a lot, a lot of good stuff, right, that supposedly this, uh, it's going to even improve well-being of individuals and have economic prosperity. So a lot of people have been attaching a lot of good things to big data. And, and I said, you know, while it, it may be true that it can facilitate or that we can learn about new approaches of how to tackle social issues, we've got to be very, very careful with it because there, it raises a lot of tough issues around equity, power, and exclusion. And that's exactly what I wanted to talk about today. So this is a work, like I said, that we've been doing collaboratively. But this particular paper um, I published uh, last year in New Directions for Community Colleges in a special issue on critical quantitative data. Um, and I really started, I, I wanted to do my homework. I wanted to even start with, how do we define big data? What, what is it? So I went to do my homework, and one of the most cited definitions talks about uh, the term of big data reflecting the growing technological ability to capture, aggregate, and process ever greater volu volume, variety, and velocity. Those were the three characteristics of the most cited definition. Now, NSF later added the issue of complexity, because a lot of big data comes from very large, diverse, and complex data sets. Think of sensors, in internet transactions, video, email, any device, any app that you can think of. So I, I like to add that, that additional layer of complexity to the definition because it really encompasses what big data is about. Um, now, the definition that we may use, it depends on whether you are a business entrepreneurial person, whether you are in the tech industry, whether you are a social scientist. So people have started to come with some sort of version of this vol volume, velocity, variety, and complexity of data. Some social scientists start to be more comprehensive and more critical about it. And they start to argue, well, actually, big data is a, is a complex interplay between technology, analysis, and mythology, mm -hmm. right? Because we're assuming that all this big data is going to help us, or it's it's uh, it's going to give us insights that nothing else has been ever uh, uh, been able to give us. And not only that, but it's going to do it accurately, objectively, and it's going to present us with the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the, some social scientists have added this component of uh, mythology to the definition. Now, I did not find a definition in any higher ed literature. And that was troubling to me because I'm in the field of higher education. And I said, well, I want to know what's going on in, in, so in big data and higher education, and in particular big data and community colleges. And I found absolutely nothing about it. Uh, but what I have been uh, suggesting is that we have scant evidence that apps work that some uh, uh, colleges that I work with, they get sold these products that are going to magically transform their colleges and their students into these very active and engaged uh, students. And they're going to do all these marvelous things. So we have scant accounts of maybe some of the benefits, but we really don't have a systematic, rigorous way to think about it. So the argument I make in this paper is that in higher education, we need to think about big and critical data. And in addition to these technical <coughs> aspects of the definition, we need to add issues of equity, power, and exclusion. Just think about it right now in this way. With this unprecedented computational sophistication, it brings the capacity to innovate. Yes, I'm not going to deny that part. and I'm going to say that's not a good thing. But it also brings new regimes of measurement. We're getting very, uh, uh, we're having like a new obsession of quantifying social processes. The, it looks very different because now we have data dashboards and we have new language to talk about these things. But we're creating new differences and we're altering power dynamics between those who produce the data, those who own the data, 
those who know how to analyze the data, those who make decisions with that data, and those who are completely excluded from all these processes that I just mentioned. And that's nowhere to be found in the literature right now. I did not find any example or any paper that talked about who is excluded and why. So my argument is that educational leaders, <coughs> and particularly people in higher education, we really must consider big and critical data within the context of the lives of the students that we really want to serve. Because if we don't do this, then we may end up just finding a very sophisticated way to reproduce inequities. And that's really the argument I try to make in this paper. So let me, let me just give you the, the, the hint of the paper. The, really the goal is that, in my opinion, big and critical data should be used for these purposes. We need to help unmask inequities. We need to use it to question models, measures, analytic practices. I don't know if you heard all these terms, predictive analytics and these algorithms. I see all these companies that present these products to the colleges, but I've never been able to see the algorithm. And I was, why, why is the black box so <laughs> black? <laughs> why they don't want to let us see what's there? Or what does it take for us as researchers to get trained in what in order to be able to see the black box? Like, do we need to start then taking computer science classes? Do we need to start going to these coding boot camps? Uh, and learn Python and do all these sort of new things. So that's, that's, that's what the space where I was and said, what sort of training I need to get and my students need to get in order to be able to think more critically about these issues. Um, the research design is going to have to be contextualized. We need to even think of stuff like sampling in this big data world. It's, it's, it's going to change the nature of our research. Just think about that. I'm going to talk that specific issue of sampling in a, in a little bit. Um, and we need to use the findings to challenge policies and practices. And we need to definitely use these big and critical data to provide more equitable opportunities for every student. That's what I think the goal of big and critical data should be. Right? This is the ideal world. So, but let's see what, what may be happening right now. OK, in higher education, the process of going to college or doing college is starting to change. I work with a ton of uh, tech entrepreneurs as a result of the Gates funded grant that we had worked uh, that we worked for the last uh, three years or five years. Um, and we were invited to this event in San Francisco at Mozilla Foundation. Uh, the hackathon, I don't know if you've heard the event that Facebook organized to, to have these innovators come together and provide solutions to end the problem of college going, the college going problem. We're going to close it because technology is the way to do it. So there was a bunch of app developers in the room and me and Regina were invited as the researchers to give them support uh, and they were pitching their, their apps and some of them so there's an app for everything right now for choosing the right college. And the, the, when they were making their presentations, these people, Regina and I were looking at each other like, they were using algorithms that Match.com uses, that eHarmony uses, to have students. So if the algorithm is the same, the data is different because they're not using clearly uh, online dating information, but they're using student level information that is captured in very different ways. And they are creating the algorithms to find, to help students find the best fit for their college. Now, it's the terminology that sometimes they use is quite problematic. But these are entrepreneurs that want to innovate and solve problems in education. Uh, there's also uh, tools to find, to apply for financial aid. This, this particular app that is called Abacus is like the kayak of uh, financial aid. You are, that's, that's exactly how they sold us, you know, the app. They said, we want to be the kayak of financial aid. So you enter all your information and boom, it gives you which colleges are going to give you the most financial aid, etc. Et yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Then there's other apps to build community. College Connect, it maps your network. These are all apps that can be hooked to, to Facebook data. So they're, they're actually 
pulling the, the information from their friendships and, their, and the, of the student and then mapping their, their social network related to college going, who went to college, where, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's, that was the benefit of the hackathon, that you had the backup of Facebook doing this, so they could log in, the, the API interface was able to work with the, with the app developers. Uh, and now, of course, everyone is connected to LinkedIn to get jobs. So there's all these very different ways of going to college and doing college, um, and entrepreneurs are, are targeting our colleges, are targeting our students, and they're selling their products. Some of this stuff is not free, okay? So that's also something very important to remember. So we have very good examples in higher education that we're using these technologies. We're all carrying this thing, right? And there's a lot of stuff happening here that is changing the way we are engaging with college. But also the provision of higher education services is changing because of big data, right? Institutions are pressured financially and they have to be accountable now. They have to do more with less resources. So that's when the companies come and say, I'll offer you my services. I'm going to, especially in enrollment management. Two weeks ago, Laura and I were in a meeting where we were discussing exactly this. There's so many companies selling data to the colleges, mining data for them to tell you, these are the students you need to be recruiting for your college. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not here to judge that, but I'm just saying we have not studied how social media or big data is affecting supposedly improved decision making, improved uh, organizational productivity, and student outcomes. Because they come and sell you the product, like if you buy this product and your student use it, student engagement is gonna go up, and if student engagement goes up, what do we know from the literature? that all these beautiful things magically happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> Students stay in school longer, they finish their program. So that's the premise. That's what's behind the rationale of a lot of these products. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some examples of what the colleges are being sold. This is one example of the data dashboard of an app that I'm gonna discuss later. So the, the company with the guys, they, I call them the kids. These are uh, very young kids selling this product to the colleges, and all what they're doing is coding all day long. And they profoundly believe that technology is gonna change education. So they code, 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 and then go to the colleges and sell these products. And they showed us this beautiful data dashboard, and the colleges were like, okay. I mean, where? and they were very excited telling us how the number of people posting on their app was going up at certain periods of time, etc. They were selling this great story about student engagement. Not only that, but they tell us, we know exactly how your students are using these platforms. We know that they're Apple users, we know that so everybody starts to buy, and you know the products look very sleek. You know, these data dashboards are, have some, some visual appeal that, you know, they look very professional, they look very well put together. Not only that, but they told them, and you can also by a click know what your students are talking about on your campus. This is a snapshot of what, what keywords have been trending in the last uh, 30 days in this uh, particular college. Um, and everybody's like, wow, you know, classes. Clearly they're talking about classes. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones. They, this is another app, by the way. This is the engagement signal. So they're trying to tell, to sell to the college, you know, you as an administrator will have, will see, you know, like with the Wi-Fi, like how strongly engaged your campus is mm. and what happens, you know, at what point and where they adding the GIS component because on the phones, mm. if you have your location enabled, we can even track in which building students are, right? So for some people it's pretty scary, <laughs> right? Uh, for others it's not because they want to start rewarding students for doing certain things on campus. Mm. So if you go to, to the library or to the financial aid office and spend some time there, dee -dee 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 -dee, you get points. I was working with Regina on designing this study uh, of, a, of an app that envisions going to college that students should be treated like reward programs, like airline reward programs. The more, you sp the more time you spend in college, 
the more points you accumulate that you can redeem for food, for gas, and for other stuff that students need. So the idea, the idea sounds like <laughs> it's a little scary, but when you think of students' needs <laughs> and the cost of living, and that they're going to receive $20 to eat that day or for gas, some students might take the option. Okay? But anyways, the engagement signal is something that I was like <laughs> particularly uh, interested about. You know? so, and again, they were selling the product to these colleges as this is a tool that will increase the engagement and therefore all these beautiful things are going to happen, like the, the, what called the Cinderella story. Right? It's going to magically translate into all this stuff. And my argument is that yes to big data, I will not say no to big data, but we have to understand that all these products are not available to all students and in all institutions. So we've got to be very, very careful about who is accessing and benefiting from these innovations. Um, and not only that, but big data cannot be a substitute for structural problems that higher education has, which is not enough funding, lack of financial aid, overworked staff. So while technology gives us a hype and things look really pretty and sleek, we can't forget that, that we have still a lot of structural issues that we need to pay attention to. And my point and my challenge lately to students has been, Yes, big data, if we here in this room or in whatever rooms I've been to <laughs> can devise the algorithms to try to capture stuff that is actually happening in colleges that is far more serious than the engagement signal, in my opinion. Not that I'm against engagement, not that I don't want to promote students attending events or being engaged and having a wonderful experience in college, but there's a lot of other stuff going on in colleges and campuses that we need to pay more attention than just the engagement signal. So if we can someone uh, <coughs> have the racial microaggression signal, that would be great. So um, any of, uh, I challenge any of the students to help me um, create one of such measures so that we could creatively then use these devices to try to create something like that. Um, now, I just, you know, in that paper, I, I do a more serious analysis about the benefits and the challenges of big data. Uh, just because of the experience, like I said, we've had for the last uh, three to five years working with this type of data. And there are some benefits. There are some clear benefits, in my opinion, that result of, of using big data. Some of them are you get a lot of real-time data that students, the students anymore, I, it's very funny because colleges now have all these very static pages. They have the Facebook, they have the Instagram, they have the LinkedIn link, they have so many things, but students are actually not wanting to, <laughs> to just have places where they can't be reciprocal or they, where they can engage with the thing. So they, they, wanna, they don't want surveys anymore, no one reads emails. So clearly things are changing and we need to start thinking about these things. Now the collocation or whatever I call collocation of services. Now people are encouraged to, to create hangouts or meetups. That means to go where the students are, right? That's the premise. Go where the students, let's have Skype meetings or let's do counseling via text. And the things are starting to change. People are encouraged to do that. And the premise is we're gonna reach more people, more students, more effectively using these collocation of services or these strategies. Um, and again, the creation of data analytics. I'm not saying they're all necessarily bad. It's just that I'm thinking, um, my point is we need to critically think, what do they mean? What's the interpretation of this data? When I worked in the, with the community colleges in our Gates grant, a lot of them look at the data dashboard the first time and they were all impressed but they never ended up using it, actually, for their own college to make decisions. So it was actually something uh, that we learned that it was pretty interesting. Now, there's, of course, a lot of challenges with big data. As I said, the collocation of services, that means being able to create hangouts and meetups and all those things is fabulous. But I recently also read a paper that was written in the 70s or 80s, Beyond Being There. It's called a paper. And it talks about email. At that point, it was 
using, a, it, yeah, it sounds funny, right? Because you say email, really? And we were, but people were questioning the role of email and if it was going to substitute face-to-face -face time. Um, and the point of the paper is that because you create a sophisticated way of being there, that does not mean that you're going to have a successful or a meaningful conversation with someone. So we've we got to be, again, very, very careful in thinking about these things. Um, like I said, big data is going to change the research. Think about it. In the case of tweets, yeah, people love tweets. And uh, usually researchers who have access to tweets, some, some tweets are publicly available. Some tweets are not. And I really didn't know this until I started digging a little bit more into this thing because I wanted, at some point I had in my head the idea of mapping tweets about immigration, conversations about immigration before Obama announced uh, deferred action, DACA, and after he announced DACA. And I wanted to map people's comments, tweets. Um, I, just, I was obsessed with doing that map. So I started asking some of my colleagues in the IT department, can I do that? They're like, sure. But you got to understand that only 1% of tweets have actual GIS data. And I said, what? 1% of actual tweets? And I said, like, I, I, could, I just couldn't believe it. And I said, OK, let's stop there. First, what if I want a sample of tweets, like a representative sample of college students? You know, Where do I get it? Oh, you have to pay for it. Pay to who, whom? So there are these companies that get the data from tweets. So tweets are not public. Tweets don't represent people. Tweet doesn't equate or is not synonyms with every single human being. Just because we tweet, or I, I actually don't tweet, um, I find it actually extremely difficult for someone who is an English language learner. I speak mostly Spanish. And these tweets, you have to, like, a, in Spanish we write, like, endlessly, <laughs> you know, like a lot to just convey one simple idea. In tweets, you cannot do that, so I aborted the mission. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but we have to be careful. And when people come and present us their research, and they say, oh, I'm using millions of tweets, and these tweets, they represent who? What, do, what, what, is, what voices are embedded in those tweets that you are? But the numbers are impressive. Every time Regina and I go and present our own, yeah, we have 39,000 students in our sample. We have 700 interviews, and we have a resilient of text information that was shared in the app. So it's quite impressive, but it still doesn't tell me who it represents. So we've got to be very, very careful in not starting to make judgments and assumptions and selling this as the panacea or this is what really students think about. Just because some students use it, that doesn't mean that everybody uses it. Um, so sampling is one of those things that is going to be changed by big data. And also think about it. Who has access to these tweets and to this Facebook information? We had privileged access because of our Gates grant. But if you guys tell me, or one of my students tells me, I want to do a dissertation on this stuff, how are you going to sample? Who are you going to have access to? Individual Facebook pages? I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to actually uh, get big data. Um, and again, big data doesn't substitute critical thinking. We have to really do our own part. Yes, the algorithms are very sophisticated, but we've got to be very careful in what we're asking the computers to predict. So, uh, and right now, they're selling the predictive models. So companies are specializing on just selling the predictive model. So you can plug in your data and have this list of students who are the most likely to succeed at your college. So what about if I'm an English language learner born in El Salvador, came I don't know how to this country, and what, how am I embedded in that model? Or am I just completely left out because I really don't appear in any of these data sets? Um, and, and the other challenge that we need to think is it's creating new classes, like I said before, new data classes of those who own the data, those who know how to analyze the data, 
and those who make decisions and those who are completely excluded from this. Learning how to use this data is not trivial. A lot of my students are actually so obsessed with the analysis part of it. And they're telling me like, oh, we should learn all these uh, text mining techniques and, and this stuff, but the way the data set is put together is actually sometimes more important than the analysis. I'm not saying the analysis is not important, <coughs> but there's so many assumptions in how we build these data sets uh, that we have to be very careful about it. So I'm going to give you a more concrete example of what actually we did uh, for that gate study. And the, the goal of the study was to use social media, one specific type of big data, I should say. It's not all big data, but it's one specific type, um, as a mechanism to increase students' connection to the college and persistence and success in college. Um, but I call it that we use big and critical data because we combine the data coming from social media with more traditional forms of data, which was the institutional data set, course level data, individual level data set, with the text information, what was actually said, or what students were talking about in their college, and interviews and focus groups and site visits. So it's a, it's a massive effort of data. That's, that's what I consider big and critical data, not just one portion of it. Um, this is now how it looks like. It's called the school's app. It, the story is pretty peculiar. This is the first um, investment that the Gates Foundation makes in a for-profit company. They are a for-profit company, the ones who develop the school's app. Um, and it's sold with the premise that it's a university-branded mobile community for your incoming class. So it's, sell, it's sold as, the, as a tool for improving your enrollment management process, right? That's really how it's sold. Uh, they're wanting to increase the likelihood of students who enroll in the college. And it was designed to help increase enrollment in four-year institutions. And this is a little bit, it looks like Facebook, but it's not, doesn't have the same functions as Facebook. So it just, it, it's connected to their interface and it has a lot of the look but it does not have the same functionality. So that's something pretty important to distinguish. Now, the Gates Foundation called us and said, we would like to test this app in community colleges. We actually don't care about the four-year sector, what happens there. These guys are making money there. They know their stuff. We want to see if it has potential to improve community college student persistence and success. So we said, OK. we." Um, designed the story very carefully. We did not want, we, we wanted a very specific sample of colleges. We ended up with nine community colleges across the US. Uh, and we did a very purposeful sampling design in the sense that we wanted low income and marginalized students in the sample. We were very thoughtful about that. So we didn't just say, let's roll it to these colleges, but we actually asked in every college to tell us which population they were wanted to reach. But mostly they were Latinos, African American, uh, low income students. And the, the, the community college that you see in the bottom that has only 1,200 cases was a very specific case that the college wanted to use the app to see if they could support their returning veterans. So again, we allow the colleges to choose their population, but we ask that they choose a marginalized population because that's what we were interested in learning. Now, the first question people have asked us is, OK, who uses the app? That was a very first basic question that we needed to answer ourselves. And all this information that I'm presenting, by the way, is the aggregate information. Uh, we had nine colleges, so we could also disaggregate the data by college. But I'm just presenting you the summary of the aggregate study. Um, and again, you can see we had very typical population of a community college, except that we had a lot of more full-time students than what we actually anticipated having in the sample. Uh, usually, a lot of the community colleges that were in the sample did not have such high proportion of uh, full-time students. That was one of the things we needed to know, you know, that we were a little bit off or that maybe we were targeting a specific group without knowing. 
Now, I remember the day I got this, I was so fascinated. <laughs> I was like, yes, my social network analysis works. <laughs> and I was, I was very obsessed with this. It took me a year of negotiating and really fighting with the engineers in the app to be able to get this graph. Mm -hmm. To be able to get the data in a way that I needed to enter it into whatever software you want. R, UCI net, whatever it is. So that's why I'm telling you that sometimes the problem is in assembling and managing data, not in the actual software. So I had to have the data in a very specific way and format in order for us to be able to, I was so excited, I was thrilled and I was showing it off to the world. And then Regina comes and says, and what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a very good point. So it means that students were making friends and connections at college. The, the students are the dots and friendships are the lines, the ties. And she tells me, what about those other dots that are isolated? They're actually called isolates in social network analysis studies. What, how do we, what do we make sense of it? What do, how do we interpret it? That they're lost in the world? That they don't have friends? That they don't care about college? That they're not making connections? That they're gonna fail because of that? So this, this, <laughs> this just told me, uh, wait a second, you have to keep this graph for yourself and learn about it and think more deeply about this because I can't sell a story, I can't really confirm any finding by just looking at this. I cannot go to the world and say, this is what's happening at this college because I'm gonna misrepresent the college. I don't even know who's vo who's, what, what's the meaning of friendships there. Friendships at college for this particular group of people means something very different than for a four-year uh, for a four-year uh, college student. Actually, <laughs> later we learn in the interviews that when we ask students, "Do you want to have friends?" I, I don't want to have friends. They're like, "I'm done. I, got, I have a life. I have a lot of friends. I just come here to study and to get my degree." So a lot of those isolates had a reason why not why to connect themselves to this network. So if I had just thought about doing a pure social network analysis, I would have been able to do something very cool, show my graph and do all those stuff and profit academically from something, but really not understanding <laughs> what that means and not being critical about this. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, but what we learned is that students actually benefited from using this app overall in the aggregate. Um, the likelihoods of persisting from one semester to another increased. Um, and one of the most revealing things that we found is what we call the passive users. Because a lot of people are obsessed. You know the graphs I showed you before? Posting, posting, liking, liking, doing stuff on the app. The people who did not do that benefited the most. People were observing what others posted what others commented, what others liked, but they did not actively engage in the app. That group, what we call the passive users, were the ones that benefited the most from this. And that is something we still struggle to uh, understand and explain, and, it, and we believe it's because once you look at the data in more context, with the context of what is being talked about, the interviews, it made sense. It made sense that the app worked as a virtual window for the colleges. It exposed to the colleges what students need, but it, they also what they have. These are not just needy students. They need procedural information, but they have initiative and they have desire to, to engage in a community of support. They are actively seeking for support and they have a lot to offer. So we also cannot portray these students as just needy and deficient and they lack and 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 lack stuff. They know what they don't know, right? They're actively seeking for that information. And that's what the app exposed. One of the most interesting cases, this is a word cloud of all the comments that they posted in the college wall. This is for one community college in California 
And the app, remember, the app was sold with the intention of helping students connect to the college and make friends and engage. And the students said, like, no, I use this app for very specific purposes. Where's my money? <laughs> How come this college is not disbursing aid on time? Where's the check? I'm having this problem. So, so uh, the app revealed so much stuff that students were, like I said, needing, but also they were helping each other out a lot. And this story of this particular community college in California, what was remarkable is that the financial aid director decided to embark on the, he was so resistant at the beginning. He did not want to have anything to do with this app. But when we showed him this, he said, okay, maybe I have to, <laughs> can you explain me again how to use it? We're like, sure. <laughs> so he started receiving emails email alerts of students whenever a, a student asks any financial aid question. So he instructed his staff to uh, attend to those emails and to start responding on the app, and they reduced the wait times by 20 or 30 percent in his office. So at least we, he started really saying, well, if we're going to embrace this, let me, let me actually try to do something good with it. So he embarked on this, and actually, right, I went back to the college recently because we're going to start a different study. And they're now using uh, the app, plus also these things that we get in the restaurants for the queues, right? Whenever you get, so students are not waiting there anymore endlessly because the lines, this is a, this is a, a big college. Uh, where students were waiting two hours to get a question answer on financial aid. And when they have childcare issues, when they have transportation issues, two hours seems nothing for us, but for them it means a lot. Uh, so anyway, this case of, um, of California was pretty interesting. And of course, we have a lot more information that we could share with you. But in conclusion, I think uh, this effort of big and critical data, like I said before, is going to require us to train ourselves as scholars and our students differently. And I say this very, very carefully. I used to teach stats for so many years in grad school. And I can do it the same way. I can't. I, I have to change the way I teach. I can't just tell my students, go and do regressions. And you know that's how I was trained. It's not going to help us get where we need to. <coughs> so that's why I was joking about the, boot, <laughs> the coding camps, but I'm actually starting to attend some of them. I just want to understand what is being taught there. The government, the uh, uh, federal initiatives are actually encouraging people to, to participate in this. They're providing money to test whether this would be alternative routes to get students what they need in order to become proficient in these new technologies and in these new processes. Um, again, there are so many new software languages. And I think in higher education, we're very, very slowly moving towards that. So this is a very serious invitation to all grad students to really rethink what sort of training you guys need to be able to make it out there with these technologies and with these new ways of doing research. Um, but really, my strong point is that if we're going any any initiative that wants to use big data has to take into consideration the voices of students, families, and communities. Big data needs to be intersected with the within the lives of the students we serve. If we don't do that, then again, as I said at the beginning, we're just going to find ways, sophisticated and beautiful ways, to reproduce inequities. And that's really my big concern. And not only that, but we're sending messages to students that only certain students and worthy are worthy and valuable of our investments and time and money and data. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we have done with our Gates grant. There's, there's a uh, website if you want to go and check it out. has all our presentations, research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that I can happily share with you. Uh, but I also wanted to take some time to tell you more about my research agenda, which is not only on big data. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I'm really interested in these four topics, which is refining theories of educational opportunity, informing language policy as a good English language learner that I still am, 
um, understanding the uh, academic and occupational trajectories of underrepresented students and still doing some work on big and critical uh, data. Uh, right now, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, we signed a contract for a book that we're going to produce by the end of hopefully this year, uh, and it's called Funds of Knowledge in Higher Education. And this in collaboration with my colleague, Judy Kiyama. And we have this framework, I don't know if all of you are familiar with it, but it, it started in the K through 12 context. And my PhD is actually in the K through 12 context. I don't have a PhD in higher education. Uh, so that's why I think I, I use this framework a lot to challenge deficit thinking. And deficit thinking, we think sometimes as a think of the past, we keep, keep reproducing it in different and sophisticated ways. Uh, so that's why we felt that in higher, educa the, in higher education there was this void of, of frameworks that really challenged deficit notions. And through the work of my students, this is really a book in honor of my students who have been working for the last 10 years with me on thinking about forms of knowledge, the forms of capital, and now critical race theory and critical pedagogy. So a lot of my students have a chapter on, on each because they've been doing fabulous research on the school to prison pipeline, on, on pop really marginal, undocumented students and how they navigate uh, higher education institutions. So this is, this is really a great opportunity for us just to put together all this great stuff and just having it uh, published. So it's coming soon. Um, my also new contention is that if we're going to change something, we need to look at the classrooms. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been very interesting, but a lot of the work I've done so far and a lot of the initiatives we study and assess, they all touch issues around the classroom. So engagement initiatives or counseling or financial aid, but the teaching and learning process remains intact. And we know nothing about teaching and learning in higher education, especially in community colleges. So we are proposing this grant to the Spencer Foundation to really understand pedagogy issues in community colleges beyond the remedial chaos that we have. So remedial education is one specific situation, but we really do not know anything about pedagogies. Even for us, like for us faculty, there's very rarely spaces where we talk about what we do in our classroom. It seems like we're the kings or queens of our own spaces, and they're so well protected. And whenever someone tells you, you know, can I go and observe your classroom? We're like, no, why? <laughs> like, do you doubt of my capabilities of teaching? Uh, but it's not to discuss. There's a lot of stuff happening in the classrooms that really affects students. So we, I really want to pay <coughs> close attention to that. Um, informing language policies. Again, this, this is a paper that we're about to publish. Uh, and it's really understanding the transition of ELLs into higher education. They're lost in translation. Once you, once you graduate from high school, you lose the label. And then there you go into the community college world or wherever you end up and you lose any support, there's no more legislation or laws that protect or that provide help uh, students get support that they need. So we did a really exhaustive work uh, in understanding the existing research and proposing new ways to study English language learners in higher education, both in community colleges and in four-year institutions. Um, and I'm very, very lately very obsessed with spatial uh, analysis and thinking. And by that, you know, we have the, this term geography of opportunity, but I really think it doesn't really grasp all the spatial inequities and the special injustices that our students are living. So I'm trying to understand how the labor market plays a role into, or what is the role it plays in students' decision-making processes, particularly, again, at the community college level. I think students are so savvy about what they want to do, how they, and the local labor market is very different. And I've been seeing these inconsistencies and contradictions. We were in Houston talking to students about their career goals and aspirations, and they're telling me about they're studying for, to be chefs and to be accountants and to be, and then I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, 
and there's no jobs in that. Absolutely no jobs in that area in those actual programs. So again, it made me question, why are we asking our students, or where, where are we, how are we helping them make these decisions about what is, where are they going to end up? I guess that was my biggest question. I mean, it's still a, a, a thing I'm very interested in. Uh, and again, in, in, in this big data world, we're starting a new project. We're moving away from the app world and entering into the text messaging. So I just met, uh, we're starting a, a project, Regina and I, right now. Uh, we, I just went on Friday to the community college in California, the same one that we use for the Gates Grant. And we're going to start mapping the financial aid process with a text messaging platform. So students are going to receive a lot of support via text messaging. They're not going to have to go to a college to get their answers um, for whatever it is that they need. So we're going to try to understand if that has potential to really improve the financial aid uh, process for students. Now, we understand financial aid process very broadly. It's not applying for the FAFSA or encouraging people to fill out the FAFSA. It is about the whole <coughs> managing of the aid from when you apply until you finish college. Because there is so much about that that students need support with. A lot of the, the responsibility relies on the students, especially at community colleges. If they're independent students, they have to prove it to the college. So it's not like my mom you know, is, or my dad is going to sign the form for me. And that's a big deal. It's like I'm a 50-year-old woman, single woman, that uh, I, I'm independent, or I'm a 18 or 19-year-old single parent that don't even know who my father or my mother is. And they're asking me for these forms and for this paperwork that it just doesn't, doesn't really capture uh, the complexities and the lives uh, of, of our students right now. Uh, I'm still doing a lot of work on the, on the critical social network piece. Later, I learned that unless I merge my beautiful sociogram with course level data from the college, I was able to make sense of that, of the peer effects of that network. So again, it ha we have to be more critical and more <coughs> conscious as to, and we published that piece in um, Manuel and I in a, in a chapter with that we call critical social network analysis. Um, and of course, right now I'm directing Harry. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Um, and uh, part of the interest that, that I'm having is in creating new surveys for community colleges. Uh, Harry has been traditionally known for his work in the four-year sector, not in community colleges, so I'm definitely opening the world to that. And I'm very interested not only in community colleges, but in the so baccalaureate market, which are credentials, certificates that are less than two years, because a lot of marginalized students end up there. And we, again, <coughs> do not know who participates, why, and what are the labor market outcomes of the students? Because they're selling that these certificates are the path to a labor success, but students are ending up in jobs that are not the ones that they studied for. And in very low paying jobs, and then the whole cycle of inequity and inequality keeps reproducing. So that's another uh, aspect that I'm very interested in. And international collaborations, just because a lot of countries regularly ask us to, you know, they look at the US system as the most prestigious, wonderful place that they want to aspire to become. So a lot of <laughs> partnerships, they look for us. And, but again, we're trying to be respectful of uh, their systems, their, um, their higher education context, but we're trying to help them collect data, basically survey data, which is what they, they've been wanting to do lately, especially countries like Mexico, Colombia, Panama. And since I'm a Spanish speaker, it's relatively easy for me to, to have some uh, collaboration with them. But that's it, really. I didn't want to uh, overwhelm you with more information. Uh, I really wanted to have an opportunity to discuss this with you and to hear where your thoughts, your feedback, your insights, anything that you guys have for me. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Terrific. So we have about 30 minutes for a conversation. 
with Cecilia. No doubt. <laughs> awesome. uh, so essentially the slide, I, I forget what the, the name of the graph was, that, that scattergram, but just to, to sort of ask about those relationships, uh -huh. that, the students, the isolates, as you said, those are people who are, they may have friends in real life, they may be connected in real life. Of course They're just they not do. clicking that friend button, is that correct? Correct. Or? Okay. Correct. And that's why we have to be very careful in how, because when, and associate this with the engagement signal. So this data sometimes is linked to those, to those data dashboards. So imagine what the colleges, the administrators, what, what type of information they're getting that the, the signal is low. Got it. Because they're not creating these friendships and, their connect and these connections. So they're low in engagement or low in connections or low in friends. So I'm, I'm curious, you, I, I really like your explanation for why you don't tweet uh, or you know, 100 points. Or is there maybe a cultural reason why you have an aversion, or there may be other sort of cultural explanations for resistance to mm -hmm. participating in these big data forms. So point will take it. Do you know of any reason why maybe um, students or isolates exist along? Well, in this, in this particular case, understand that the, the app was sold to them as a social engagement tool. Mm -hmm. And when they heard that, they're like, I don't need friends. That sure. This yeah. is what exactly what they, they told us in the interviews. I have plenty of friends. I'm very happy with my life. I just need support. Help me connect. So when we started asking them, OK, what sort of connection would be meaningful for you? Well, help me connect with my peers in relation to jobs. Mm -hmm. Or in, in, help me get my homework done, because I have doubts for my homework. So if I'm going to be able to connect with my classmate to better prepare for a test or for an exam, I want to create a connection. But they're like, look at me. I'm a 50-year-old woman who has three kids. I'm trying to have a better job and a better life for my kids. I don't have time for, to socialize on Facebook. And not only that, but this is a Facebook account that they had to open on top of their regular Facebook. This is not their personal Facebook. So this was a way to help them make friends in the college. And these people go take class and, and leave. So the whole friendship notion is what we were questioning. And you know, so we had to be very careful. That's why the interviews were very helpful for us. Without the interviews, we would have selling a very different sure, story, yeah. right? Which, yeah, I, I wanted to jump in on that very point, right? Because people who use data in these ways will look at this and make some sort of interpretation about who these students are. So it seemed to me that the qualitative component here, this really drove you to ask a particular set of questions to, um, to, to really arrive at a more nuanced understanding of Correct. You know, these students' social lives. And that's where I said big and critical data has to be the big data that came out of this, but also the institutional data. We have every aspect. For some colleges, we had course level information. So we knew what course, who was in what courses. So, so we were able to later, I pulled out from this, I said, OK, let me do a key actor analysis. Who are the key? So what are the friendships they're forming? Are they part of their classroom? Are they not? Uh, you know, so we need to go way deeper than just, and then contextualize, for instance, this other, um, sorry, this other word cloud so we had what students were posting on the app, but then we had the, the ability to go back in, to put it in context. So in what context was money talked about? Give me my money, when is my money coming? So we had all the history and we had the context, but we also had the interview data right. to be able to say when students, when students need financial aid, they need this, they're talking about this. And then we interviewed also financial aid advisors, and financial aid staff. So, and we spent at least two or three days in every college when we went to do the site visits. And we were <coughs> meeting with administrators, meeting with students. So, we really spent a lot of time in these colleges to try to understand the, so this out a little bit of the culture of the place and trying to understand more about it. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really uh, illuminating. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the you, know, you made the point, you know, it's not only to focus on the analysis, but, you know, are we organizing data in ways that are, are useful to us? So you talked about they're working with the engineers to 
be able to get the data prepared for um, the, the social network analysis. Can you just talk a little bit more? No, that that's a great, that's a great question, and I'm I, I, and I'm going to struggle with this with the same th with now with the text messaging company. Uh, when we were invited to the Gates Foundation, I will never forget this. So they put us on the same table, right? The, the creators of the app, which are these kids, right? They're like very peculiar kids. <laughs> I, I had a big fight with them one day for the data that I will never forget. And Regina texted me the picture of one of them because I was getting so infuriated that he would not understand my research needs, you know? <laughs> and she texted me, the, and it's literally this picture of this guy in the skateboard, you know, in San <laughs> Palo Alto, you know, coding. And I was like, hmm, I think I need to <laughs> really relax and understand who I'm talking to, you know? I will never forget that day. Anyways, the, the app data, I, I, we sat in that table and they told us, you know, can you study this? How would you design a study? They were testing us. How would you design the study? So we're start pitching ideas, but I never ever seen a data set from them. So I said, okay, I think I can pull this off, but I don't know actually how to do this. So we got first, um, you can download the data from the app in a CVS format. Uh, right, which is a text format or whatever Excel can convert into a lot of stuff. Uh, but the problem was how that data was stored. And I'm going to give you just a very quick example. So, and I'm, this is because I think of data sets all the time. That's how my brain is uh, functions. So they have the friendship variable, right? The friends and the IDs of all the friends. Right, so they do have a lot of information, the ID of the student and the, whether they liked something, uh, the, whether they comment or not, and the text, all the text was here. Mm. This is in an Excel file, this is just <laughs> one cell, they embedded all. Yeah. And not only that, but they, the IDs were his friend with student 35, comma, with student 77, with student 417, for <laughs> And I cannot do my social network beautiful map if the data is like that. And that was my fight. Mm -hmm. I said, I need, to <laughs> my, I need to merge this into R. I need to merge this into NVivo to do qualitative analysis. And I need to merge this into other Excel ways, right? Or into other softwares to do other stuff. I cannot do it like this. So we, they, we had to create a program specifically in a language called Ruby that engineers use to be able to translate these into then something that I can then turn into Excel, into Vivo, into R. So the, uh, not only Ruby, uh, Manuel helped me devise some other uh, macros in Excel that were intermediaries to prepare the data to move it like that. It took us one year to do this. Yeah. And that's why I say it's simple, but it took us, and then not only that, to this add the beautiful complexities of how we receive the data from the community colleges. Every data set is different. They don't have the same variables. They code it differently. They merge it differently with uh, student level data, course level data, they had another file. And financial aid info was another file. So to merge all this, to be able to make sense of it, it took us one year. And like I said, that this is this is a class I would like to teach that is called dirty data. <laughs> <laughs> because this is what, what we don't understand sometimes. It, it students <coughs> like to have this, and then they ask me questions about, oh, let's use HLMs and regressions. And, that's the least of your concerns, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, my opinion, yeah. right? Because I can now Google and teach myself how to do a uh, propensity score matching. But I cannot teach you. <laughs> it's very hard to teach this. Mm -hmm. How you manipulate, how you transpose. This is about transposing data sets that are this length, but then the other is a square, and one is a rectangle, and how you merge that is, is magic. Is it requires a very specific skill set that, again, a lot of students in education don't have. And that's what worries me, is how are we training our students to do this? 
and to think about these things, because without this, I can't do the following. Or I'm going to find something, and then what Sean said, I'm going to start attributing and misinterpreting data. And that's what, for me, is very problematic. Yeah, so this is a great example. Um, our, I have a project on MOOCs. I was looking around to see if any of the students in particular are here, because they figured out how to do it. You know, really, big data, it, I just want to underscore the point that big data is not necessarily good data. We had so much different data, all these different files. And the other issue I think that's important in the conversation is that these data are being collected by people who don't really care about research. That's, that's, right? a, that's exactly the point that they, they, to have them, so the, I had to ask the Gates Foundation to intervene because they didn't want to make me this Ruby process. Yeah. I had to learn myself to, to manipulate Ruby and I said, I don't, I don't care, I'll learn Ruby, but do it. But they, they're not researchers. They're, that's why I call them the kids coding because that's what they're doing. And not only that, but they have very profound convictions about technology and the power of technology, and they hold a lot of power. If this kid was still mad, I would not get my data in the way I needed it, right? And, the, and he really could not care about my social network analysis. He is interested in the functionality and how he's going to better sell his product. And every time we require a modification, we tell them, look, the app, the friendship thing, doesn't work for these students. Can we remove the function? <laughs> you know? They're like, no, because then the whole product and the whole recording for them and the whole changing aspect was gonna be and that's not that was not their thing. So but Laura is on point is these are people that are not trained to to be researchers. So we need to start partnering with them, understanding better where they come from conceptually, like what, what are their thoughts, what is it that they do? So that's why sometimes I like to spend time in their offices trying to see what is that this kid do all day. And right now I'm going to have the same problem with the text messages. I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to get, but I need to figure it out. And luckily our students, like you, in your case, they usually figure it out. So, but, but I think the, the problem is that we're not teaching with these tools. Yes, Charles. <coughs> um, so just to add also on the qualitative side, so at the very beginning of the project, as um, Cecilia so greatly illustrated, the textual data was uh, decontextualized. So as many of us know in social media, you have like a thread of a conversation. Exactly. You wouldn't get the thread. No, you just get the cell. So and I didn't know who responded to that right. comment or not. So it, it was so very. So we had to do like some level of inferential analysis and observations. And we didn't really know, right? Like we were all figuring it out, but we had to go then to the app and see, okay, based on the keywords we found in all of these texts, how do these types of conversations play themselves out, and then be able to construct some sort of archetypes of how people were engaging with the technology. And we really found that that people were pushing against the friendship idea, where they're using it as like a, a sort of black marketplace of sorts to like sell computers and books, or mm -hmm. find places to live, <laughs> like real estate services, yep. um, or. Some of the campuses or the colleges had multiple campuses. So they were just sort of trying to geo map themselves of who's on North Campus, who's on East Campus. Um, but we didn't have that. And we also didn't know the ecosystem because what we found is sometimes when people would make friends in the app, they would leave and have conversations somewhere else and we didn't have access to them after that. Especially students that were like meeting in orientation. And now that we met in this space, oh, well, I'll send you a message and we'll talk offline. We have no access to that information because we as administrators couldn't go see those people's pages. So it was a like, big sort of cluster of things that we didn't understand we had to figure out. And not only that, but you have to be very careful when you're interpreting and when you're communicating and when people ask us, so what did you find? What did you find? What did you find? Uh, so we had to be very, very, very careful in not saying, first, I, 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 we told them to gauge, we're not marketing researchers. I'm not here to endorse your product or to make it you look very, I'm a social scientist who <laughs> wants to understand how to solve you know, problems and inequities. Uh, so the, the same we have to be very clear with this text messaging company. We're not endorsing your product, we're not marketing researchers. Are you aware of that? Yeah, okay, then sign a contract. But <laughs> because if I find that your product is not working, I mean the result is only three colleges are still using the app. The others shut it down because their students did not find any value. 
And of course, they're not paying anymore for the product because Gates paid for the three years of the product. Mm -hmm. And after that, they had to pay from their own pockets. And they said, it's not worth for my college, for my students. It didn't work. The case of the returning veterans failed miserably. Mm -hmm. Returning veterans do not want to vent their issues on Facebook. I mean, they have serious private stuff that they went through. And while this wanted to be a community of support, they were not willing to talk about anything on the app. The only thing they wanted is information for jobs. That's the only thing they wanted to, you know, to exchange on the app. So that's why we, we learned so much from, you know, from doing this exercise. But it required at least one year of, of dairy data <laughs> preparation and uh, a lot of thinking and even theoretical frameworks. We don't have engagement. Honestly, I just aborted the mission. Never call it again. It's not about engagement in community colleges. It's about something else. Can you talk a little bit? And I will, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I, I enjoyed it just as uh, this. But can you talk a little bit about um, the appetite or the desire for institutions to enter in some of these agreements and what the reasons behind those uh, desires are the reason? Um, or the kind of so I think were? that's an excellent question because we, uh, the most successful cases we had of the app come from the institutions that the leadership wanted really to innovate and to use the technology. So that, that was very clear that we had a, 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 some colleges in Arizona that the leadership gave us access because they wanted the money from the Gates Foundation. That was the appeal. But they never did anything for the app. So the app failed miserably since the first semester we put it up. Uh, but the institutions are being sold because after you know we engage with them we build relationships and they still keep calling us and say you know they came and offered me this product can you tell me if it's good or not so they're being inundated with technology and with products and that's exactly what again that's a big cloud that we don't know about and i i constantly ask them so who made <coughs> the decision to buy this sometimes they the the directors or vps buy the product and they just tell them you have to use it and you know the financial aid director is like, well, I have to use. It. Others have more initiative and more control. So the, the community college we're working in in California now with the text messaging, he has a lot of innovation and a lot of discretion to decide what to use and what not. But the colleges are, I think, some of them are desperate to increase graduation rates. So they will use whatever they're sold. And they don't have a framework to evaluate. They don't have a guidance that says what to look for. So that's what me and Regina are trying to write about, is at least when you are introduced to these products, what kinds of questions they should be asking. To help them, guide them through that thinking of who uses it, how, why, when, so that they can at least start being more critical about these products. But what worries me mostly is the enrollment management process. It's billions of dollars that people, are, uh, the institutions are paying uh, to get data, to target very specific students who are very likely to succeed. That's a premise. Very likely to succeed. They pay trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And we do not know the algorithms and how they're getting all this data. Because this must be a lot of publicly available data that they're pulling together. They're doing this work for us at a larger scale, right? And they, then they have some algorithm that tells you these are the people, these are the names of students who are very likely to succeed at your institution. So go after them. And then recruit, market, do all the machinery. Uh, but these are usually four-year institutions, not community colleges, clearly. I wanna, my name is Justice uh, Walker, and I wanna thank you, as everyone else has, for uh, sharing your insights um, that are Broader, they're broad range, they're ranging mm -hmm. and very broad, and they all kind of touch on these ideas of inequity that I appreciate, especially when it comes to science education and occupational opportunities. And so, uh, I like that you point out or you underscore how, as you just did, the creation of these algorithms are often carried out by people that are not representative of the groups that are of study and. In addition, some of the data sets aren't even representative of the population of at large. And so, um, given some of the work that you do in educational and occupational trajectories, 
can you talk a little bit about um, how students or what your work has revealed about students making decisions to pursue uh, 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 educational endeavors or occupations in the sciences that would position them to uh, generate algorithms that are that are captured. We, we don't positions. have enough. There's not enough. People. There's not enough people of color in these programs. Mm -hmm. It's it's very sad, and that's why I started the so baccalaureate study because they're being pushed to very specific service and healthcare industries that are all very service related. It's not even nurses. Nurses is like the cream, right, of that. Is I'm, I'm telling you about massage therapies. So, so you start looking at that, that's what was getting very scary to me and revealing, and I said, holy moly, this is another kind of worms and that our students are being pushed into these professions with these uh, ideas that they're gonna get these jobs. Some of them don't exist locally. And they end up in jobs that are completely unrelated to whatever they study. So we're trying to title the paper or the, the, the project of the, the road to know the, 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 the end, the dead end degrees. And that's again why then then people ask like well why did they you know they already have a degree or some sort of higher education form, but they end up in these very low prestigious, low paid jobs, and none of them are <laughs> I mean the the few 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 ones that are, but if you go every time we went to Mozilla Foundation every time I meet any of these companies I do not see any people of color. So that's, that's, that's a big concern because they're producing the data. And that's why I talk about the data classes. And the data classes have not, it's, it's, it's socioeconomic status, but it's race and it's ethnicity embedded in those data classes. Because they don't own the data, so they're completely excluded <laughs> from any of those aspects. They don't produce data, they don't own the data, they don't know how to analyze it, and they, right? So we, I, I, again, that's what I'm talking about, finding sophisticated ways to reproduce the system. That's what we're trying to basically find. So we have about 10 minutes left. Raise your hand if you're a student who's staying for the lunch and conversation with Cecilia. Okay, no more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have your time with her. Are there any questions from anyone else who's, who's not staying for yes. lunch? So my question is for um, higher education leaders using big data and also administrators. So as we start to see some higher education leaders and administrators who have a different relationship to big data start to lead in these institutions, uh, just what recommendations do you have for them as they refine their approach to using big data in the college context to help college students? The training of them, like at least give them a, like we said, for instance, someone like Charles and the type of research he's doing and he helped us do, he's in the position to go to these colleges and tell them, look, this is, this is, these are the questions you need to be asking for these products. That's the beginning. And then partnering with researchers to evaluate whatever the, so they can come to us and say, can you evaluate this for us? Can you help us design the research that will go? Some companies are very open to that because they need the research. They need some sort of thing that they can put in their website and to say, I'm working with the university so and so and so, and my research says that 27% increase. That's the only thing they want from us. They said 27% more likelihood to persist. They put it on the website. They would care less about the other stuff, right? So we have to be very careful, but I think working with researchers that Again, that, that the, the partnering with them of people who know and start understanding about, and you don't necessarily need to know this stuff. You need to be aware <laughs> that there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of stuff that they need to be aware of. Just ask them, who is using these tools? Who are you targeting? Because they want to roll them to the entire college like a one size fits all. This will help all the college. No. And we rolled it like that in the colleges, but because we couldn't say, oh, you, you can use it and you can't. We just roll it to everybody, but we were very clear in the study design who we were going to follow and who we were we talking about. So I, 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 and that's what I'm doing for the text messaging. We learned so much from the Gates grant that now I'm 
sitting down with the college, making sure actually the study is larger than the text messaging portion. The study is to test the effectiveness on a, of a very specific intervention that the state of California wants to do on a grant. They want to give 600, extra $600 to students who do certain things in the community college. So that's the goal of the study. We're going to use a text message to see if that's a tool that we can use. So we're trying to design studies with the colleges that uh, make sense for them, not for the person who, went, who is producing the, the technology. So I have a, a different um, spin on, on Wilbur's question. Um, and it's a largely four-year context question. So one of the things that I hear administrators really struggling with right now at four-year uh, places is yeah, yeah. So could you maybe talk about, like, um, could you give us some advice? Because we're thinking about, you know, how might we aggregate um, what happens in YIPDAC? Because as you may know, there's a lot of racism that happens there. And we're trying to make sense of it, and administrators really want to make sense of it and, uh, and better understand it, too. So, but, to, but again, just to understand your question, what advice to give administrators regarding? Sort of how to um, interpret and, and make use of, um, you know, the thousands of, of things that are posted on GitGap. Well, right now, first, I don't see any tool that summarizes th that type of data. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, it's like the word cloud. It's like, this is what is trending. Yeah, but trending among who? Yeah. Who uses that? So the first advice, for me, the big basic question is who uses, who posts this information? Who's left out? I think that's the challenge there with GitGat, right? At least you know that it's very likely someone on your campus because it's isolated uh, geographically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we don't really know. But we don't really know because I can be here with this, publishing, posting something somewhere else. But it is context related, right? So more than likely, yet yeah, users would post, you know, some content that has college con uh, that's within. The so is, it would be a way to interview some of those folks who are actually posting. Oh. Yeah, but you don't know who they are. They're anonymous. They're anonymous. So, but yeah. at least inviting some of them to come up to you and say, "Would you be interested in talking to us more about these issues?" I think we would run into probably the same problems as Cecilia mentioned, of wanting to contact if you say we need these data, and then the data that they provide us actually doesn't give us what we're looking for. And, and, it, and that's exactly the point, because when I wanted to do my tweet map, I had to start thinking, okay, uh, do I have the money they're going to charge you? Mm -hmm. Probably. And whenever they tell you, I want to give you data, you have to ask them who is represented in that data. Are you going to give me a sample of everyone? Or are you going to give me the entire population? So you probably would have to contact the company directly and ask for all these questions so that you can understand who is represented in that data set. And it's a, a big challenge in Yikyak in particular because I was thinking I'm trying to do something. But if you take Philadelphia, for example, and just the geolocation in this area, you have Drexel and Andy Sciences that all post the same geofence for Yikyak versus being in Bloomington, Indiana, right, where you, most likely most of the yaks are going to be, or most, excuse me, most of the yaks are going to be, um, you know, in the, from IU or, you know, maybe Ivy Tech. So it's, so it, so then going to your and saying, for Philadelphia, right, you know, how do you segregate yeah. between U Sciences, mm -hmm. Drexel, and Penn, and who is posting when you have three universities, you know, that all touch each other, you know, in the same, in the same location. Yeah. It's, it's, very, it's way more complicated than what it seems. When you start thinking about the process of, oh, okay, they're all within the same zip code. So that's why this process, it, you need to sit down with them to figure out this process, because this is the black box. And some of them are not willing and wishing to have you a key to the black box. That's a negotiation that was, we had, we had Gates as an intermediary, but if it was just us, the researchers, they would have not given me the key. That I, can, I can tell you that right off the bat, but it's because Gates told them, you have to give them the key if you want the money. Mm -hmm. oh, OK. <laughs> that, was a, that was a pretty compelling reason for them. All right, one last question before we do the transition here. 
Um, so I have a bit of a selfish question. So we've all been seeing the recent headlines that uh, students are, at, in terms of the highest rate in 50 years, likely per to participate in protests from the day that you all just published. And I'm wondering uh, if you have or will you be considering, one, um, the issues uh, for which those students are ex expected to protest and also the locations on which they're expected to protest, whether those are re uh, relegated to campus-based protests or also participation off campus. We, we don't know, but what I'm working on with the higher data is I'm gonna create, I hired a computer scientist to help me do an API. Mm -hmm. So we can start in knowing what are the issues. Mm -hmm. At least what are the issues. I don't know, I, would, I don't know if the location will be able to tell just because of that problem of the tweets that yeah. has only 1% of them have the location, but at least the, the type of topic or whether it's on campus or off campus related to other larger, bigger incidents on mm -hmm. cities or some more neighborhood issues that are not necessarily campus related. Yeah. But we're getting close to have uh, this guy who lost some tweet data uh, merge into the Harris data so we can start seeing some of that. Awesome. So, but again, the problem, I need a computer science. I cannot do it myself. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have the skill set. I was trained so statically into the stats regression world that I cannot do that. I can learn how to use Ruby a little bit or Python, but I cannot do the interface. I cannot, so that's why we need to start partnering more with IT departments, with computer scientists, with people that, we need to be the intermediaries. That's what I think is our role, the intermediaries between all this stuff so that we can start understanding really the assumptions behind all this data that is being produced. People are making a lot of decisions and stories about it, but they really don't know what's behind it. That's the scary part. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Um, so one tradition in this series uh, is a 25-year series. Uh, so you are joining a, a distinguished roster of people, including Louise Moll, uh, who's given a talk in it. But one tradition is to present the scholar with a framed copy of the poster that was used to advertise the talk. So we will we will mail this to you. We won't make you take it. Because I'm pregnant, so either I carry a baby or <laughs> We will simplify this for you, but um, thank you so much no, for being so our much. guest and for giving such an interesting and compelling talk. Um, for those of you who um, are interested in having people like Cecilia um, be a part of the series moving forward, feel free to, it's a very easy nomination process. Just send us a name and an institution and we go from there. Uh, you can either send that to me or the more fabulous Dr. Harper mm -hmm. here, uh, Jesse Harper from the Dean's office, or to uh, Dean Grossman. And we meet one day in the summer and go through all the nominations and decide the folks to invite. So, you know, <coughs> there, there are people whose work you're interested in and would like to see them here, let us know. Um, so, in this next portion, we've created some time for students to do a deeper dive with Cecilia so if you have additional questions about her talk, um, this would be an occasion to do that. But also, if you want her advice on your own research interests or your own career trajectories, this is a t this is a time for you to be with her. And she knows a lot, uh, and she's so generous and, and wise. Uh, so yeah, this would be time for you to have lunch and talk with Cecilia. And the rest of us will leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you.